Well, friends, hear now God's Word. Acts 10, verse 30. And Cornelius said, Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears Him and does what is right is acceptable to Him. As for the word that He sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with Him. And we are witnesses of all that He did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put Him to death by hanging Him on a tree. But God raised Him on the third day and made Him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with Him after He rose from the dead. And He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that He is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To Him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in Him receives forgiveness of sins through His name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. This is... God's Word, and may He bless His Word to our hearts. Well, we come now to this second glimpse of Acts chapter 10, and the Gospel is breaching the Gentile regions according to Christ's Word at His ascension. So far, we've seen that the Lord has shown Peter the end of the dietary laws and the implications of that end. That namely, the Gentiles are no longer to be regarded as unclean, and thereby incapable of fellowship with the Jews. Indeed, the Lord's great plan is to take those of every nation, tongue, and tribe and make them one people in Jesus Christ. All the ends of the earth must turn to Jesus for salvation. Further, we saw last time the patience of God slowly teaching Peter amidst his resistance and kindly rebuking Cornelius when he gave worship inappropriately, when he bowed down to Peter, the Lord is not only showing us that he's the Lord of all, both Jew and Gentile, but that he's patient with all. Additionally, we've seen something of the glorious significance of gospel preaching. While an angel could have told Cornelius the message of salvation, that's not the plan of the Lord. The Lord has chosen to use the ordinariness of a mere man speaking about Jesus, a called and gifted man, but a frail man through whom the Lord speaks to bring to bear His supernatural power on the hearts of His people. And the amazing thing is, as the Gospel is faithfully proclaimed, it is the power of God unto salvation. For the Spirit is doing supernatural things in hearts as a mere man, but Christ's man preaches Christ's message to the people. Well, that moment of gospel heralding has now come. Cornelius, his relatives, and his close friends, they are all here assembled to hear what Peter has come to say. So Peter will proclaim the gospel. 
And we're going to note four things in our text together. But we begin first with a listening people in verses 30 to 33. Now, Peter mentions with his God given new perspective as he starts that he obeyed the Lord. He says, verse 29, I came without objection. It's interesting that Peter is finally not objecting. He was objecting to the visions multiple times, but he came without objection. And then Peter asked the natural question, why did you send for me? Now, Peter has already heard this from the men Cornelius sent to him the previous day of the angel who had appeared to Cornelius to go get Peter. But Peter wants to hear the story from Cornelius himself. Thus, Cornelius details it all again. Now, this is interesting because it's the third time in the chapter we've heard about the same thing. Why is the Spirit of God telling us this over and over and over? Well, in the 21st century West, we might be those who don't like repetition. We certainly don't have patience with people who tell us the same stories. Again, have you ever gotten that pat on your arm? Honey, you've told me that already. <laughs> Scripture, particularly a narrative, repeats the same stories. Why? Well, there are a multitude of reasons, but three that we should think about. One here is certainty. This really happened. Two, importance. This is a crucial event. Something monumental is happening here and you should pay attention. And then third, God is definitely at work. There's a surety of firmness that God is directing what is happening. This is not man's work. Man didn't come up in a boardroom with a marketing strategy. How do we get the gospel out there to people beyond the Jews? God is directing the issue. And Cornelius basically says all the same things to Peter. But the point is to relate to Peter that the impression of the angelic vision was so strong, Cornelius is still marking time by it. Note he says it happened four days ago, about this same hour, verse 30. And then Cornelius did what he was told. I sent for you at once, verse 33, and you've been kind enough to come. But then note the conclusion Cornelius draws as Peter has arrived to speak. Verse 33, Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Now friends, there are two things in that statement worth pondering. First, don't miss the declaration of this Gentile. That is, God's messenger comes to him to preach the Word of God as they worship that we are all here in the presence of God. We often hear talk about being in the presence of God when the church gathers. That as, as the church assembles, like a people gathered to hear the gospel, we are there in the presence of the Lord. And sometimes, of course, we hear Matthew 18, 20 quoted, where two or three are gathered in my name. There Jesus says, I am among them. That verse is relevant, though it's striking that that's in the midst of the exercise of church discipline as the church makes its judgment. But this verse in Acts 10 is focused on sitting under the gospel preached specifically. And yes, it's true, we are always in the presence of God. In fact, there's nowhere you can go to get away from the presence of God. Jonah tried. It didn't work. You can't separate yourself from the God who inhabits eternity. He is everywhere. But there's a special presence of God, a unique drawing near of the Lord as we draw near to Him, as we enter, as it were, into the heavenly Zion and we come to mingle our voices with those angels gathered in festal array and the spirits of just men made perfect. Here is a unique drawing near to God in worship. When we come to hear Him, when we come to receive His Gospel, to hear His ambassadors speak to us of Christ as though God is making His appeal through that man, when we are there to receive the Gospel expounded, we are uniquely gathered in the presence of God. And His eye is specially upon us. Doesn't that make worship where gospel preaching is happening so significant? Doesn't it thrill your soul that God is near to us like that? It's significant for the preacher. He preaches in the presence of the living God. Better not corrupt the message. 
but it's significant for us all. God is among us to speak to us. And how is He speaking? Through His mouthpiece. A mere man who yet carries a divine message with authority. Remember how Paul will tell us in Ephesians 2 and he's reflecting on Jew and Gentile coming together as one new man in Christ. That Christ came and preached peace to those who are far off and peace to those who are near. When did Jesus go to Ephesus? He didn't. But He did when Paul went and preached to Jew and Gentile. What a perspective. This should give our worship. That Christ is addressing us. The gathering of the people of God is a sacred assembly. And God has called us into His presence. And He, the great and almighty King, is here. And how do you hear Him today if you hear His voice? Do not harden your heart. How do you hear Him in the Word? That's being emphasized here. Because that's the means that God is going to use to save Cornelius and all these gathered. And it's the means He's still using by which we are being saved. The Word of the cross. And then that moves us to a second thing under this first heading. Cornelius and all these others are conscious of being in the presence of God. To hear what? Note the text. To hear all that you, Peter, all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Peter, we are not gathered to listen to you share your opinions. We are not here to reflect on your musings of Jewish and Gentile relation, of cultural sensibilities, of political reflections, of traditions associated with Jew-Gentile relationships. This is not story hour. This is not a time for our entertainment. We want to hear chiefly and only what the Lord has commanded you to say, and we want to hear it all. The apostles don't carry a message of their own invention. They don't get to put their own spin on things. They are heralds. And a herald is simply one who makes the king's message known. He has no liberty to alter anything. Isn't that clear here? Say to us, Peter, what the Lord has commanded. Exactly that and all of it. Give us all the saving message. Everything we are to believe about who God is, about what Christ has done, and what the Lord requires of us. And that will be the very message that Peter will preach. And we'll get to the message in a minute. But again, we're seeing the importance of the Word. The Gospel that Peter proclaims is not some story made up to inspire people to selfless service. It's a divine message of salvation. It's a word of unbelievable grace. And we hear it as from the Lord. That doesn't eliminate, of course, being a good Berean. Making sure that what is said is what the Lord says. But it does mean we come with a readiness to hear all of it. We, like this assembled group, prepare to hear. We give diligence to hearing that we would welcome the Word in our heart and then practice it in our lives. We listen as those ready to receive all that God is saying to us. And all is the stuff that confronts sin. Give me the uncomfortable bits that show me my misery that you might make much of my Savior. Show me there's no hope in me for salvation. No movement in me towards spiritual good. That I'm a depraved sinner and I need rescue from bondage. I need the power of God to shatter the shackles of my sin. And there is sin is explained in its nature in its effects, in its deserts. That's all an offense to man. Remember, Paul will say as he preaches, he doesn't preach to please men. The Lord commands, His commands include the declaration that we are desperately sick. But I want to hear of my sickness that I might hear of the power of my Savior. I want to see the depths of the lows of sin that I might see the glories of Christ. Is that what we want? Is this the message we want to carry into the world? All the Lord says. Not a truncated gospel that heals the wound of the people lightly and therefore gives them only a a truncated Christ and not Christ in His fullness. Do we want the full gospel? The whole counsel of God? 
Do we want the word of grace, the estates of Christ, the offices of Christ, the benefits of Christ, all the work of Christ, the attributes of Christ, the blessings that Christ gives his people in their obedience to him? Do we want all of it? Do you see the hunger in these people to hear the word? May we hear like this. But then second, we see with me pride put off. Verses 34 and 35, this anticipation is in the air as the Gentiles hunger for the pure spiritual milk. But before Peter gets to the gospel, he relates something about God himself and his saving purposes. You see it in verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now, this is, I think, a confession from Peter. Peter and his fellow Jews had believed, had fallen into faulty thinking that their favored status as God's people, those with the scriptures, those brought into the covenant, those redeemed from Egypt and given special laws, they believed that these things showed them their superiority over all people. They were slipping into the error that God was partial to them. And while it's true God gave Israel special privileges, the thought that God is partial runs contrary to what God Himself had told Israel. Deuteronomy 10, verse 17, Moses said, The great, the mighty, the awesome God Yahweh, He is not partial. It's pretty clear, right? God doesn't play favorites. He he gives justice to the fatherless and the widow. And then this is particularly crucial in Deuteronomy 10. He loves the sojourner, the alien. On that basis, Moses told Israel, love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You recognize what's being communicated. The the Israelites were outcasts in Egypt. They were strangers in a foreign land, but God had mercy on them. Thus, when the Gentiles are among them, they're not to be disregarded. They're to be loved and cared for. Why? Because God isn't partial. God doesn't look on a Gentile and say he's just an outcast, a reject, someone less than human. No, the Lord values all the sons of Adam, all human beings. He discards none as worthless Didn't we see that powerfully in Jesus' ministry? Where He didn't just speak to the leper to be cleansed. I'm always struck by this passage. He reached out His hand and touched Him. Or the Samaritan woman. No one will speak to her. That's why she's at the well in the middle of the day. She's an outcast. And Jesus is willing to address her. To make a point of connection, interestingly, on a shared humanity. Give me a drink. He's thirsty. He puts himself in need before this woman because he values her. And yet the Jews were not valuing the Gentiles. And the Jews were trying to find a theological justification for their bigoted views. Jews had come to believe, and Peter is sucked into the cultural blindness of this, That God had chosen them for something in them. We are morally superior. God has made us His own because we stand out. We are strong. We are smart. We are sophisticated. But what did Moses say? You were not chosen because you were righteous. Deuteronomy 9. Further, Deuteronomy 7. You were not chosen because you were more numerous. You were a stronger people. Yahweh loves you because He loves you. The choice of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was not because of anything in them. Go back and read of the lives of these men. And that masterful survey Dr. Morales gave us last night. They're flawed men, but grace snatched them. God's free, unmerited, totally unconditional favor was lavished upon them because God isn't partial. This is true for us, isn't it? We are rescued by grace Only because of grace. God isn't partial. Remember how Wesley asked the question in the hymn, and can it be that I should gain? Or how Watts asked it, why was I made 
to hear your voice and enter while there's room. Remember, he envisions that feast. And there we are with all of our hearts and all of our songs. We're joining to admire the feast. But each of us cries with thankful tongue, Lord, why was I a guest? Grace, only because of God's free grace. God is not partial in saving a people. There's no pride here. Nothing can strain God to act. He did it for His own good pleasure. That's breathtaking. But there had been a corruption of this grace as the Jews were giving themselves credit as though they could claim a hold on the grace of God exclusively. It's one reason the Jews had despised Jesus. How can a Samaritan be the hero of the story? Are you kidding me? How can Jesus offer mercy freely to these despicable people? We are the sons of Abraham. But oh, do you remember that to Abram God had said, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. You remember how the Psalms speak of this blessing of the nations? Psalm 67 the psalmist prays that God would make His face to shine on Israel. For what purpose? That God's saving power would be known among the nations. Listen to these declarations of the psalms. Psalm twenty-two, twenty-seven: All the families of the nations shall worship before you. Psalm 45, 17. Nations will praise you forever and ever. Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. And please continue in the verse. I will be exalted among the nations. Psalm 67, 4, let the nations be glad. Psalm 96, verse 2, declare His glory among the nations. Psalm 117, verse 1, praise the Lord, all nations. Psalm 72, 11, Solomon's song pointing to Christ, the messianic kingdom. May all kings fall down before Him. All nations serve Him. Seems plain, doesn't it? But here, they missed it. Well, here's a wonderful moment. Peter says, I get it. I lay my pride in the dust. I see that God accepts people of every nation. He accepts anyone who fears Him and does what is right. What is the beginning of wisdom? It isn't becoming a Jew. It's fearing the Lord. And all who fear Him, regardless of ethnicity, background, or class, all will be blessed by Him. What is the motivation to tell the nations of our God and His salvation? Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What a glorious declaration that is of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, what does it lead to as we understand this call of the Gospel? It leads to a fear of Him. Isn't that how Psalm 130 puts it? There is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Brethren, do we understand that? The fear of the Lord. You remember Jesus asked a striking question. And I'm, I'm appreciative of Dr. Hamilton talking about his uncomfortableness with the Word of God. This, this verse jumps all up over me. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do what I say. Is there a fear of the Lord, an attitude of heart that's evidence in our actions? But the crucial point in this text, God will accept anyone of any nation who fears Him. Now repeatedly, we've seen in the Gospels how the Jews thought they were favored on the basis of their bloodlines. And yet Jesus is showing them they're not accepted. Without faith in a saving faith that always looks to Christ and always yield works, without real faith in a real Savior, there's no real fear of God. But then there's people like the Gerizim demoniac and the Syrophoenician woman, Gentiles, who yet have real faith and real fear, and they are accepted by Jesus when everyone else writes them off. The world may treat you as worthless, as unworthy of any thought or any care, but the Lord God, the Almighty, is not partial. He accepts anyone who fears Him. And doesn't this give us a compulsion to preach the Gospel? 
to go into the nations. Come, O children, David says in Psalm 34. Come and listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. I've been captivated by his deliverance. Let me tell you the fear of the Lord. There are no people excluded from the saving mercies of Jesus Christ. Peruvian street children. Albanian Muhammadists. African animists. Indian polytheists. British secularists. American hedonists. Low class, high class, culturally acceptable, cultural outcasts. God is no respecter of persons. Anyone can have grace teach their heart to fear. Praise God for that truth. But then how does God broadcast this amazing grace? Well, He uses preaching. And we see now Peter's sermon, the good news of peace. Thirdly, the good news of peace. Peter now begins laying out crucial gospel facts. Verse 36. He says, as for the word that he, that is God sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Uh, Peter is saying at the outset of his message that this is a message of peace from God, that you can have peace with God through Jesus Christ, that God is reconciling sinners in Christ. And that reconciling work resting on Jesus' work isn't different for Jews than for Gentiles. There aren't two paths to peace, there is one message of peace. There is one proclamation of good, do, good news. That glorious language of victory. The announcement of the good news. You remember when a, a war was won, a herald of the king was sent to announce the good news of triumph. Second Samuel 18, Ahimehaz goes to bear the good news. That's what takes place in gospel preaching. What we announce is not what we do to get peace. Do this, do that, and then you can have peace with God. No, we announce the good news of triumph, the tidings of Jesus Christ. We publish His glory, and we call men, women, boys, and girls to look to Christ and live. Hear what He accomplished and cling to Him that you may have peace with God. And that peace, that good news, brethren, it rests on a collection of facts. This is a crucial point. Nation made some a hundred years ago in Christianity and liberalism, that the good news, which begins with a triumphal indicative, what Jesus has done, that it's necessarily historical. We're talking about facts here. Real stuff accomplished. Not abstract ideas. Jesus did something to secure for us who believe peace with God. And the things that He did are the only path to peace with God. Now, Peter's about to convey the gospel message, and we should note what he's going to tell us is the same stuff preached to the Jews at Pentecost. God has one message for all, Jew and Gentile, and it's an, it's an unchanging message. Don't we see that throughout the march of the book of Acts? We hear preaching from Peter, and Stephen, and Philip, and Paul. And they preach to kings and to commoners, to Jerusalem Jews and Hellenist Jews, to Samaritans and Gentiles. We keep getting a record of their sermons and they all communicate the same stuff, the same facts. What does that mean? The gospel does not change on the basis of culture. The gospel does not change with the march of time. The gospel never changes in view of the audience. We don't recast or reconstruct the gospel. There isn't a Western gospel, in an Eastern gospel. There is a gospel, the good news of peace, explaining the historical work of Jesus Christ. That is unalterable, and it will never accommodate itself to modern ideas. For there's one message about Jesus, and without the facts of what Jesus did proclaimed, no gospel is communicated. Hear me again. Without the facts of what Jesus did proclaimed, no gospel is communicated. This puts to bed the famous saying of Francis Assisi. I'm sure you've heard it. Preach the gospel at all times. And if necessary, use words. That is total nonsense. 
implicit in that statement is that preaching the gospel doesn't require words, verbal proclamation. Indeed, some will argue the most powerful sermons are without words. Just go to the impoverished at the end of the earth. Go to those among the nations and give them food and give them water. And that itself will preach. Was certainly true that we as believers in Christ should have lives that garner attention as we are zealous for good works, that we let our light shine before those in darkness. But friends, you can't preach Christ without words. Jesus didn't come as a mere example. He came sent from the Father with a message. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And then Jesus sealed his message with his blood. Jesus then sends his men with a word, with a content of truth, the word of the cross, which is to be announced, heralded, spoken. And without that gospel proclaimed, there is no gospel. There has to be gospel content. So what are the facts of the gospel here? Well, Peter conveys at least 10 of them. You'll be thankful to know I won't now move into a 10 point sermon. You got to remember, this is not a word for word account. Luke is giving us a summary. In fact, scholars have noted in this passage that Peter's summary really summarizes the whole of Luke's gospel. And notice it's interesting. Peter starts with the preparatory ministry of John, verse 37. And note the public nature of what he conveys. You yourselves, he tells the Gentiles, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. The ministry of John, then followed by Jesus, wasn't hidden in a corner. Droves of people from all over Judea were going out to John. Caesarea, where Cornelius is, is part of the Roman province of Judea. In other words, Cornelius and the people gathered here, they heard a stir several years back of people going out to John. He was preaching, prepare ye the way of the Lord. He was calling people to repent and look for the Messiah. And then, of course, Jesus' ministry begins at Galilee, as Luke recorded. And as Jesus began His ministry of preaching and healing, the word about Him went everywhere. Again, Caesarea is some five miles from Galilee. And according to Luke 6, a great multitude from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon came to hear Jesus and to be healed. Cornelius and these others have heard of Jesus' works. They didn't hear Jesus directly. They haven't heard all of Jesus. That is, who He is, what it means, what He's done. That's why Peter is here. But news of great things had reached them. News of factual things. And you could easily think the reports about Jesus were all overblown. Peter insists that they were not. Look at verse 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with Him. The miracles of Jesus performed after His anointing with the Spirit, they demonstrated that He is the shoot from Jesse's stump. He is the Spirit-filled King. And His kingly power is evidenced as He overthrows the curse. Satan's power is crumbling before Christ. The devil can't resist him. Sickness and death heed his voice. Jesus is clearly empowered by God. And these stories of healing, of demonic exorcisms, they're not fairy tales. They're not exaggerated reports. For Peter adds, and this is striking, verse 39, we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Do you see how Peter is pointing to historical credibility? We saw Jesus do this. We witnessed it all. Everything communicated about Jesus' power was seen. The clear fact that He was equipped with miracles, it was seen. Peter's saying, I'm here to tell you, the kingdom of God has broken in as, as Isaiah proclaimed. The blind sea. The deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead are raised, 
The devil's tyranny is defeated. There's hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet there's the shocking fact. Though Jesus was filled with the Spirit, possessed divine power, and He was doing good among the Jews. Verse 39, they, the Jews, put Him to death. And not just any death, but death by hanging Him on a tree. Now as a God-fearer, Cornelius certainly would have heard about the curse of God falling on one who is hanged on a tree. The Jews looked at these great works of Jesus, the very one with whom God walked, we would say, whom God attended. They regarded him to be accursed. And Jesus really died. It begs a question, doesn't it? How could the God man die? Why would the anointed one clothed with the spirit go to his death? Luke doesn't give us more detail here in this sermon of Peter, but but certainly we remember earlier sermons in the book. Philip's meeting with the Ethiopian eunuch in particular, that the death of Jesus was in view of our son. Isaiah 53, God laid the iniquity of us all on Him. He is the Lamb of God. He's bearing our crimes. And while these wicked men killed Jesus, wickedness didn't prevail. This was God's great plan. This is what He had purposed. That the stone that the builders rejected would then become the cornerstone. And we see God delight in His Son, verse 40, as He, God the Father, raised Him on the third day. Jesus, His death was under the judgment of God, and yet God Himself vindicated His Son. What does it mean? The sacrifice of the Lamb of God for sinners was accepted. That it is finished. That Christ has purchased salvation for His people. He came to save His people from their sins, and He has done it. And to make it clear that the resurrection is not just an idea, not just a a mystical notion, some type of spiritual thing disconnected from the physical, Peter adds that God made Jesus to appear. Now Jesus didn't appear, verse 41, to all the people, but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with Him after He rose from the dead. Do you see how Peter is again stressing eyewitness testimony? We saw these things. He was not an apparition, some kind of ghost. We didn't dream this up. We didn't hallucinate. This is no myth. Jesus was truly raised. He had a real resurrected body. We ate and drank with him after the resurrection. There is true triumph over the grave. It's not as though Jesus' body is still lying somewhere in a tomb in Jerusalem. No, the tomb is empty. The body of Jesus is full of life. He didn't appear to die. He really died taking our judgment, and He really rose. And His resurrection is physical. He's already laying a foundation for that glorious eschatological reality of union with Christ. And that we experience resurrection as Christ is the first fruits, and that's our hope. The day Isaiah anticipated where death will be swallowed up in victory. It is here. It has arrived. And for the Christian, death has no sting. How do you go as a missionary to reach an unreached people contemplating the thought that you may be laid in the ground there. That it may be full of suffering. That you may be overwhelmed with opposition and even killed. It's a striking thing, isn't it, that the believer can look at the ugliness of death and all of its horror. And it is horrible. And yet say, you hold no sting for me. There is hope because of Christ's resurrection. And then Peter adds another crucial fact. 
to the life, death, resurrection, and appearances of Christ. Verse 42, And He, that is the Lord, the risen Christ, commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that He, King Jesus, is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Now, this is crucial for a couple of reasons. Cornelius told Peter, we want to hear all that the Lord commanded you. And now Peter explains the command of the Lord. And what was it specifically? It was the command to preach and to testify. Peter is under compulsion to preach the gospel. Paul himself will say later, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. God had given these men these facts, the thing that that they witnessed, and they must declare them. And of course, that declared message does not die when these apostles die. For by the Spirit's power, we have the record of apostolic eyewitness testimony in the Scriptures. We've been given the gospel of Christ resting on the foundation of the apostles, a gospel with historical veracity. And while we ourselves haven't seen what they saw, or received a direct verbal commission by King Jesus to go, we, those gifted and called to preach, we must keep preaching. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Thornwell, when he's writing on the calling to the ministry, There's a lot of debate about the nature of an internal call. But Thornwell says, this is it. If you feel in your soul, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. That's it. You're called. Is that call gripping you? Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. I'm captivated by the living Christ and I must announce the glory of His name. Why must I do that? Because this is the means that God has appointed to save sinners. And then a second vital fact here, Jesus is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. In other words, Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus will judge All, Jew and Gentile, every soul will reckon with the Lordship of Christ and their sins violating the law of God. Do you understand the facts of what Jesus did? His life, His death, His resurrection, His ascension. Those facts matter for all people. All people must be told. You have to reckon with the resurrected King, God's appointed judge, You must seek Him to be rescued from judgment. All people need this message. Because without that message, they are going to an eternal hell. They need to hear of Christ and His glory. The only provision that their sins would be pardoned. And do you see how Peter brings it something to a grand conclusion in verse 43? To Him, to Jesus Reigning as king and judge, all the prophets bear witness. The whole Old Testament pointed to him so that everyone, not just one little ethnic group, but everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins through his name. Peter is saying, as he said earlier in the book, there is salvation and no one else save Jesus. He's the only name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Turn to Christ. He is the snake crusher. He is the prophet like Moses. He is David's greater son. He is the lion from the tribe of Judah. He's Emmanuel. He's the prince of peace. Rest on Christ. This is the word that the nations need to hear. Only by his authority as judge and only by his death and resurrection. Can Gentiles be forgiven. But if we believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior, we believe that our sins, which are due judgment, can be washed away. He is the fountain for sin and uncleanness. Friends, are we banking our souls on these facts? Here we are, all of us. A people 
on the way to death? Are we ready to stand before the judge of the living and the dead? There is only one way to escape condemnation. One path to life. And it is simply to rest on Jesus' condemnation for you. Are you doing that? Are you looking to Christ? Repent and rest in Jesus alone. And then knowing there's only one way of reconciliation. There's only one escape from judgment. Let us tell sinners there is forgiveness. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the most glorious articles of our faith is that declaration, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Are you overwhelmed at your own forgiveness? That you might tell others of the sweet salvation found in Christ who pardons all your guilty stains. Indeed, should not compassion for perishing sinners drive us? John G. Payton has been mentioned. His name has been mentioned a number of times. He seems to be a hero for all of us. He speaks of his calling to the mission field. And one of the aspects that drove him was the wail of the heathen. It's so convicting to read that. To know the, the hardness of my own heart. The lack of compassion in me. The wail of the heathen that I, I can't push away. I, I must go. Do we feel the wail of perishing sinners that we would give them the word of life? And brethren, let's give them the facts accurately and clearly call upon them to believe in Jesus, to repent and trust. Because that is God's means to save. Well, finally, and very briefly, see with me, the Spirit poured out. Much time could be spent on what is here. But let me sum up in this last point. We see in verse 44 that the Spirit interrupts Peter's sermon. You probably wish the Spirit would do that to some sermons you've heard before. And just stop. The Spirit falls on all who heard the Word. What does that tell us? It says that all of these people believed under the preaching of the Gospel. They all turned to Christ. He poured out His Spirit on them. And it's just as He had done to the Jews at Pentecost. This amazes the six Jewish guys there with Peter in verse 45. Because they're still holding on to the prejudicial ideas about the Gentiles. But the Spirit shows them, convinces them, that the Jews and Gentile, that they're fellow heir together, fellow member of the household of God. That what the sinner needs is not a different diet, ceremonially clean food and so forth. What he needs is faith in Christ alone. And the content of the gospel isn't eat this and dress like this and go to this event and get this mark. The gospel is look to what Christ has done. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Cling to Him. We don't carry a message of moral transformation to the world. If you only followed these rules, you would have a blessing. No, all of our rule following is rotten. We need to recognize that Christ is our obedience. And we trust Him. And God is now here in this age of the Spirit, the Messianic era. He is turning the nations to seek the root of Jesse. And the Spirit's blessing is demonstrated as the Spirit comes upon them all. In verse 46, they speak in tongues. And this isn't telling us that every believer upon conversion speaks in tongues. We've only heard of tongue speaking at this point in Acts a couple of times. Acts 2 and here, many other people have been converted. Not to mention in Acts 2, it was the apostles speaking in tongues and now it's the Gentiles speaking in tongues. The, the point is the tongues are a tangible sign of an epochal event. Namely, through Christ's triumph, as He pours out His Spirit, Babel, as a curse, is reversed. It's not reversed over and over and over again. It's reversed once in view of the triumph of Christ and the outpouring of the Spirit. Judgment came to the nations for their rebellion against God. Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. 
And now the Lord is overthrowing the curse. Grace is conquering the power of sin. And as the gospel is spreading from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria to the Gentiles at the end of the earth, the Spirit of God is confirming the gospel expansion. The echo of Pentecost here is marking the progress of the gospel. The new age has dawned as power ripples out to the nations. Striking the very language of Pentecost that the Spirit fell upon and poured out is used here. It means also that the gospel facts that Peter communicated are true. The Spirit is owning the message, we could say. Jesus is the long-awaited, Spirit-filled Lord and Savior. And there's salvation for all who believe in His name. Salvation isn't a wish. It isn't a vain hope. It isn't something distant from us. It's a real, free gift given to every believer. We bring nothing but our sin to Jesus. We hear of what He has done. We trust. And He changes us. And having been changed, we declare. Peter finally gets the fullness of of all the Lord has been teaching him. He sees nothing should be held back from these believing Gentiles. They should receive the sign of inclusion into the people of God in the new covenant baptism that is not a sign of Western imperialism. If you heard Chad Vegas speak earlier, you'll know what I mean. If you didn't, you need to go listen. Here's a guy who is not Western and he's not white saying baptism should be administered. And the Spirit has shown Peter, we welcome these Gentiles in the name of Christ. A people far off, strangers to the covenants of the promise, who were once without hope and without God in the world, they can be brought near and united to Christ. And if that doesn't thrill your soul, you don't understand what it means to be a Gentile. But we've been brought in by the blood of Jesus because His blood breaks down barriers and binds people together and then sets us apart as belonging to Him. Baptism. I belong to Christ. And as those who belong to Christ, what do we do? Washed, cleansed by Jesus, sought and saved by the Lord, tasting this deluge of Gospel blessing on the soul. We want that message to go to others. There is a way to be washed. There's a way to have peace with God. There's a way to enter into forever communion with the living God through Christ and the power of the Spirit. And that is the most glorious thing in the world that a sinner could know. Well, let us then go. Go and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that Jesus declared and clinging to that word of Christ. Lo, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray together. O Lord, our God, we come and we marvel at the power of your gospel. We marvel at the great things you have done for us as those who are but hell-deserving sinners. And Lord, our great sin is our lack of amazement. How we can be so cold to these heartwarming truths. Forgive us. Forgive us for not treasuring the Gospel and weeping tears of joy at the forgiveness of sin in Jesus Christ and longing to see others come to taste and see Your goodness. Oh Lord, if we have tasted and seen, would You compel us to speak of our Savior? And Lord, would You raise up those even in our very midst to be sent as laborers into Your harvest field that as the heathen wails, that that wail would come to be a cry of repentance and faith. In Jesus, our glorious King, in whose name we pray. Amen.